summer of 1940, a small group of young men and their aircraft were all that seemed to stand between the British people and invasion by the Nazi war machine. In the months that followed, the few of RAF fighter command would engage the Luftwaffe in savage aerial combat over southern England. In the summer of 1968, some of those aircraft were in the skies again to appear in the classic British feature film, Battle of Britain. Now, using unseen footage from that production, this series will tell the real story of the Battle of Britain. Throughout August 1940, the Luftwaffe's relentless attacks on the RAF, in the air and on the ground, had threatened to destroy fighter command. But as the Germans switch to a terrifying new attack, the RAF is given a vital breathing space and the opportunity to hit back. month, huge formations of German bombers have targeted vital RAF installations, including airfields, aircraft factories and radar stations. Many, such as RAF Manston, are bombed repeatedly. The outnumbered pilots of fighter command fought back against this onslaught. Few in number, they hurled themselves again and again against vast enemy formations. Now, people say to me, how many did you shoot down? Now, I never look back. Believe me, I never look back uh, to see what damage I'd done uh, squirting down a whole row of bombers, because we were outnumbered about four to one, uh, and in fact, the 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 one one overs and the one o nines got in one another's way trying to shoot at us. So, the the secret of success and survival was not to fly in a straight line for any length of time. You did a squirt here and a squirt there, remembering, of course, that we had considerably more. Uh, targets to shoot at than, uh, than the enemy. One day, I did five trips in succession, and it was very stressful. It was more stressful waiting, uh, trying to read a book or sleep. Most people seem to appear to try and relax and sleep. But you were obviously very much on edge. And in a way, I was much happier when we'd been scrambled than I was waiting, <laughs> though I didn't know what was going to happen when we got in the air. I started off the battle being petrified that I'd be shot down on my first trip. I finished up the battle wanting them to bring more over so I could shoot more down. This was because I was only 20 and was very cocky. By the end of August, the RAF had lost more than 400 fighter aircraft. And more than 200 pilots had been killed or wounded. Actually, was shot down behind me and jumped out the parachute, and uh, it, it malfunctioned, so he was killed. But after that episode, I definitely didn't make any more friends, close friends. And I'd already uh, shied away from most. Uh, and I didn't even know the names of some of the people that. Uh, joined the squadron and uh, subsequently got killed. 
for all the skill and courage of its pilots, Fighter Command was in danger of losing the battle for air superiority over southern England. But Hitler was impatient. He had been incensed by RAF bombing raids on Berlin. Now Luftwaffe intelligence reported that Britain's fighter shield was on the brink of collapse. And so he ordered Goering to proceed to the final climactic phase of the air war against Britain. London and other industrial cities were to be targeted by massive bombing raids. Britain's war industries would be obliterated. Attacks on the capital would force the RAF's last fighter reserves into the air, where they would be destroyed by waves of German fighter escorts. The people of Britain would then see sense, forcing their government to seek terms. Almost 1,000 German aircraft head for England. RAF controllers, alerted as always by the chain of radar stations guarding Britain's coastline, scramble 11 squadrons. They expect this fast formation to split up when it reaches the English coast, proceeding to RAF airfields and installations across southern England. But the huge formation continues on its steady course. The controllers realize it can only have one target, London. OK, try to scramble. Squadrons already airborne, patrolling 11 Group's airfields are hastily redeployed. A further 10 Hurricane and 9 Spitfire squadrons waiting at dispersal are ordered into the air. The Spitfires of 602 Squadron are amongst the first to make contact with the huge Luftwaffe formation. The RAF pilots are no strangers to disparity in numbers. Outnumbered over 10 to 1, they attack. Swarms of ME-109 fighter escorts pounce on the British aircraft, beginning a desperate, twisting dogfight as the bomber formations fly on. Every available RAF squadron is in the air, racing to intercept, but the bombers reach London. High explosive and incendiaries rain down upon the city's docklands. The east end of London is soon ablaze. There were hundreds and hundreds going over. There was no end to them. And everybody was looking up. And because my mother, she all, when she heard a bomber, she would bury her head in the couch and say, oh, my God, help us. There is intense air combat over Kent and the Thames estuary as British fighter squadrons rip through the returning bombers. As night falls, more bombers arrive over London. Sheltered by the darkness, they are now safe from attack. But the darkness offers no protection to the stricken city. Guided by huge fires, they add their bombs to the destruction below. The attacks continue throughout the night. Tons of high explosive and thousands of incendiary bombs rain down upon the capital. 
my boyfriend and I were standing on the corner saying good night and we could see all these fires. I mean, really, the sky was lit up red. And yonder, you know, you knew, well, that's London. The sirens were going, uh, fire engines. The first massed raid over London had cost the Luftwaffe 40 aircraft. Fighter Command had lost 26 aircraft, with 11 pilots reported killed. They had not started bombing London, and they'd stepped, kept up bombing the airfields. We may have kept up with um, uh, aircraft, but we'd run out of pilots. And so, if that being the case, you know, they could have won. As Luftwaffe bombers turned their attention to the capital, by both day and night, Fighter Command was given a much-needed respite. And despite the terrifying destruction wrought at the nation's heart, the new German strategy played right into the RAF's hands. As dawn broke over London, about 350 Londoners lay dead, killed by German bombs. 1,500 had been injured. The German High Command was encouraged. Their bombers had got through. London was ablaze. Surely the end was near for Britain and her disintegrating defences. The strategy was confirmed. The Luftwaffe would concentrate its efforts on one target, London. Of course, when um, we see the papers and went to work, they were all saying, didn't London have it last night? At London's expense, the country's air defences had gained a reprieve. Dowding took action to nurse his battered organisation back to health. To overcome the desperate problem of fatigue amongst the most battle-weary squadrons and the lethal lack of combat experience in the squadrons that replaced them, he introduced three categories for his operational squadrons. The first category were the frontline squadrons to be kept fully operational at full strength and fed replacements as necessary. The second category consisted of squadrons at full operational strength and capable of being called upon to assist the frontline units. Gentlemen, I'm pleased to say that at long last we have... The final category consisted of squadrons in quiet sectors, where experienced pilots could be rested while they passed on their knowledge to others fresh from training. In red sections. As pilots recovered or newcomers gained experience, they would be fed back into the frontline squadrons. Just having his squadrons that he moved about, he could, could serve his forces. During the actual business of fighting, when you're, as I say, when you're 19, you're too busy ducking and weaving to pay too much attention as to what you're doing. The, the strategy of the situation, the strategy of the war, and even some of the tactics of the war, you know, you're not too, really too worried about. They don't concern you because you're too busy trying to keep yourself alive. Well, gentlemen, I'm pleased to say that at long last we have 12 airworthy... Battle Harkins. tactics were refined. What we'll be doing Squadrons were to attack in pairs. Uh, I want, uh, they were discouraged from pursuing Martel damaged planes, to, uh, but to find uh, fresh uh, targets. We'll be flying at uh, 15,000 feet. I want, uh, Keith Park, Kosti, commander of 11 has, uh, Group, which had borne the brunt of the assaults, emphasised the importance of early and accurate interceptions breaking up the formations, stripping the bombers of their fighter escorts. Head-on attacks on the bomber formations were encouraged. Huge concentrations of aircraft continue to attack London. An 
number one Canadian squadron's Hurricanes are amongst those engaged by the fighter escorts. But this earns other squadrons a clear run at the bomber formations. London was at the very edge of the ME-109's range. Burning fuel rapidly at combat speed, they could spend only a few minutes over the capital. The Endurance, the 109, the Reichweite, it ging gerade bis London, five minutes, then back. No sprit mehr, it's red light. And we were befohlen direct escort. Das heißt, wir mussten unsere Geschwindigkeit reduzieren und mussten an, 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 praktisch neben denen fliegen, was grundsätzlich falsch war. Ein Jagdflieger braucht frei, die Freiheit des Luftraums, um seine Position zu wählen, die Speed zu wählen und so weiter. Nicht angebunden an den, den er eskortiert. Da ist dem wenig geholfen. Und nun kam natürlich auch die Spitfire oben gewartet und haben, wir hatten enorme Verluste. Despite their successes, tensions had surfaced among senior RAF commanders. Keith Park, commander of 11 Group, believed it was vital to intercept early. Using the advantage gained by radar, small numbers of aircraft would hit the enemy as soon as they crossed the coast, disrupting German raids before they reached their targets. As German escort fighters became entangled in dogfights, other squadrons could then attack the unprotected bombers. commander of 12 Group, believed in assembling several squadrons into one large formation, before hitting the enemy with concentrated force and aggression. Keith Park disagreed vehemently with this big wing concept, as did others. Okay, can make a big impact, but it takes time. And the one thing that wasn't available during the battle was time. And we said, well, what a waste of time forming up and all at that time the bombers are coming in and are probably on the way out. And to imagine trying to, sitting around and waiting to form up into a big wing, I'd say would be a total fa would have been a total failure. As autumn approached, the weather became less suitable for air operations. Nevertheless, the Luftwaffe mounted large raids, resulting in fierce dogfights over Kent and London. And the nightly blitz on London continued. In spite of the difficulties of locating the enemy in the dark, attempts were made to intercept these nighttime raiders. The only way you could identify what the airplane was was by getting underneath it at night and getting a plan view from looking from underneath up at the shape of the wings. And we slowly flew up and closed in formation behind it so I could get my gun sight onto it and open fire. One or two interceptions later that the Air Ministry were pressed by newspapers as to why I had had success at night. The Air Ministry were determined not to give away the fact that we had effective radar or something in our night fighter that allowed us to close in on other aircraft at night. And the Air Ministry said that I had exceptional night vision. Cat's eyes, 
cats are supposed to be able to see by night, I think. Uh, that was how my name uh, started. Swiftly, Fighter Command was recovering. The numbers of trained pilots available for operations was increasing daily. New fighter aircraft were being produced and delivered to squadrons at a rate that exceeded their losses. Reich Marshal Goering, meanwhile, reassured by over-optimistic intelligence of the kind he liked and expected to hear, believed the enemy to be fatally weakened. Now was the time for maximum effort. A single raid of such overwhelming force that it would bring about London's ruin and the certain annihilation of fighter command. German bomber squadrons rendezvous over the Pas de Calais. Circling above them, the fighter escorts burn fuel as they wait for the huge formation to assemble. Starting from a few aircraft to suddenly having to put up 250 plus was very, very scary. Während die Bomber weiter im Hinterland stationiert waren, waren die Jagdflieger, weil sie ja wenig Sprit mitnehmen konnten, mehr an, an, in der Frontnähe. Um, um nun so einen riesen Pulk zusammenzubekommen, Bomber und Jagdflugzeuge, musste man sich sammeln. Da wurden bestimmte Sammelplätze wurden bestimmt. At 11 Groups Operations Room at Uxbridge, the day had begun quietly. The personnel in the underground plotting room whiled away the time. The Prime Minister had chosen this day to make an unexpected call on Park and his command. Forbidden to light his cigar within the confines of the underground bunker, Churchill settled himself above the operations room. Its large map and indicator boards reflected the uneasy calm. Watched by the electronic eye of the British radar chain, the German formation continued to mass on the other side of the channel. Bis alle diese Flugzeuge sich zu, zu einem großen äh, Pult zusammengesammelt haben, brauchte man Zeit. Das kostete Sprit. Diese Bomber in großen äh, gesammelten Formationen mit den Jägern zusammen Richtung England in Marsch setzten. Dabei hatte man schon einen Teil des Sprits verbraucht. Und jetzt äh, wurde, äh, wenn die Ziele weit genug weg waren, weit weg waren, war natürlich äh, der Sprit nicht mehr ausreichend. Und wir Jäger konnten die Bomber nicht mehr weiter schützen, weil wir keinen Sprit mehr hatten. So dass diese Bomber denn dann schutzlos den englischen Jagdfliegern ausgesetzt waren, ohne Begleitschutz. Und dadurch hatten wir natürlich sehr große Bomberverluste. Northwest Vic Y for your for Charlie. Churchill watched as a WAF plotter acting on the information fed through the system moved the markers representing the first of the hostile aircraft to head towards the English coast. With ample time to organize squadrons and alert supporting aircraft from surrounding groups, the air defenses of Britain are ready and waiting for the incoming raid. More markers crawl across the plotting table. Squadrons from Biggin Hill, Northholt and Kenley scramble to get airborne. With radar giving the enemy's course and height, 
and knowing London is the target, RAF controllers confidently position their forces. As the leading German formations cross the coast, the RAF fighters sweep in. The German pilots brace themselves to receive these last few British fighters. The Spitfires dive out of the sun, bouncing the fighter escort. The air is full of weaving aircraft as ME-109s attempt to fend off five British fight squadrons. A second wave of RAF squadrons arrive, attacking head-on. The bomber formations struggle towards London. Most of the fighter escorts remain over Kent, entangled in desperate dogfights with RAF Spitfires. At this moment, the big wing of 12 Group joins the action. Given plenty of warning, five squadrons of 12 Group, 55 aircraft have assembled and now pile into the fray. With RAF fighters attacking them from all angles, many bombers jettison their bombs immediately and turn for home. But even as the remains of the morning's raid land back at their bases, another, larger formation was mustering over the coast. As always, it is monitored by the watchful eye of British radar. RAF squadrons land and are rapidly rearmed and refueled. Exhausted pilots will only have a few moments respite. The German formations fly out over the channel in three huge columns. The British fighters are scrambled for the second time. Every squadron available to 11 Group is soon airborne. 250 British fighter aircraft in the air and ready. As the cumbersome formations cross the English coast, fighter squadrons from Hornchurch fall upon them. Two German bombers are destroyed before the 109s can intervene, locking the RAF pilots in a frantic dogfight. It is a repeat of the morning's fighting, with one grim variation. The British controllers have assembled a large number of their fighter squadrons at the point where the German fighter escorts will be getting low on fuel. Two 13 and 607 squadrons from Tangmere tear through the enemy formation near Biggin Hill. The ME-109 escorts attempt to fend them off, their engines burning fuel as they push their aircraft to full power. Over London, Duxford's big wing has returned to rejoin the fight. The Luftwaffe has battled its way towards London, losing aircraft to constant attacks. Now, over the city, it is hit by a total of 17 fighter squadrons. Gur 
Turing's claims of an enemy on its last legs are revealed as a fantasy of bad intelligence and his own complacency. The German escorts, their fuel warning lights glowing, are forced to disengage. The bomber formations scatter their bombs and turn to their bases. Staggering under the constant fighter attacks, the surviving aircraft are harried all the way back across the channel. At the end of the day that would become known as Battle of Britain Day, the RAF had lost 26 aircraft and 13 pilots killed or missing. The Luftwaffe had lost 60 aircraft, an enormous toll, if not the 179 aircraft claimed by RAF pilots. The following day, Goering again claimed that fighter command ought to be finished in four or five days. He dismissed reports from his pilots about the strength and skill of the British fighter defence. But Goering was blind to the truth. His Luftwaffe had been decisively, bloodily repulsed, and Britain's aerial defences were now stronger than ever. On the 17th of September, Hitler himself recognized that an invasion of Britain had become unfeasible. The enemy air force is still by no means defeated. On the contrary, it shows increasing activity. The weather situation as a whole does not permit us to expect a period of calm. The Fuhrer therefore decides to postpone Operation Sea Lion indefinitely. Now Hitler would try to bomb Britain into submission. London would continue to suffer. Night after night, the bombers returned to the battered city, which burned like a terrible beacon. Strangely enough, we expected to be bombed. That was part of the deal. We knew the Germans had the bombers. The worst part was, first of all, the sound of the um, air raid warning. It's the most frightening, chilling sound because you knew then that they were coming over. And then the drone of the bombers, which was a, a very familiar sound, getting louder and louder and louder, and the guns crash, 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 and then the whistling and, and the bombs falling. I was travelling through London, uh, and you could hardly get off the tube trains. because of all the people sleeping in, in the tubes. You have to walk, walk, virtually walk over bodies. And I also remember the place shaking so, uh, the whole building shaking, and one would have thought the building was going to fall down. You just was in the air raid shelters and you just stayed down there and that's all you did do. Petrified. You were frightened to go out. But the danger and destruction did not break the people's will. Instead, it strengthened their determination. After the bombing in London, the shops would be damaged, the roads would be damaged, the buses weren't running. But among everybody was this need to get back into the office that day, whether they walked, cycled, got a lift. And it was this determination to stay fighting. We still went out at 7 o'clock in the morning to get the tram to go to work, 
And, I mean, you couldn't go out once you went in the building because you was too frightened. We just went over the road to get something to eat and come back to work. And then when we came out six o'clock at night, we hadn't got down to the Old Bailey and the sirens would go and you'd just have to run for your life then to get on the tram to get home. The, the courage, the morale of the British people in 39, 1940, um, I, I find absolutely wonderful. Despite their terrible losses on the 15th of September, the Luftwaffe did not entirely abandon daylight attacks. With large numbers of fighter escorts sweeping ahead of them, the bomber formations cross the English coast. Interception by 15 RAF squadrons is swift. German escorts have to fight their way back. For some, this means a low-level, desperate chase across the English countryside. Others use the 109's greater climb rate to escape the conflict and head for home. At the end of a day when the Luftwaffe failed to hit any of its primary targets, they lost 55 aircraft, the RAF 28. On the last day of September, the Luftwaffe launches a number of separate raids across the channel. RAF fighters intercept each raid as it crosses the English coast. Rather than fight their way through to their targets, the formations retreat, scattering their bomb loads at random. But hidden by cloud, one small group of bombers and their escort managed to reach central London. The 30th of September on the Nachmittag was a schlimmes Erlebnis. We have over the Wolken uh, Junkers 88 begleitet. And schon am Anflug hat der Führer wohl London verfehlt. Ist viel zu spät umgedreht, hat seine Bomben ins freie Feld äh, geworfen und anstatt Wolken über London hatten wir freien Himmel und es war voll im Himmel von Spitfire und Hurricane und deswegen sind die Bomber nicht auf dem direkten Weg zurückgeflogen, sondern zurückgeflogen über die Isle of Wight hat ein nach dem anderen von den Piloten gesagt, zuerst meine rote Lampe brennt. Das ist wie im Auto, wenn die rote Lampe brennt, hat man nur noch wenig Sohn. Nach der roten Lampe sagten insgesamt 21 Piloten, mein Motor steht. Und nacheinander haben sich so 21 verabschiedet. Davon wurden nur zwei vom Seenotdienst gerettet. 19 sind ertrunken. As his pilots perished in the cold waters of the channel, so too did Göring's vain hopes for the success of his Luftwaffe. The German losses this day, 47 aircraft. The RAF lost 20. It was the last time the Luftwaffe would mount large daylight raids over England. Goering had sent his air force against a nation prepared. 
as the pilots of Fighter Command rose up to meet the aerial invaders. From the all-seeing eye of radar to the system of communication and control, the pilots of Fighter Command were supported by an air defense system of unparalleled sophistication, far in advance of anything Goering or Luftwaffe intelligence had anticipated. The consequences were more than 900 German aircraft destroyed. The Luftwaffe lost 3,000 of its most experienced pilots and aircrew, killed, injured or taken prisoner. Die deutsche Führung und das, was uns befohlen wurde, war absolut nicht in der Lage und war nicht richtig informiert, die englische, die Royal Air Force einzuschätzen. Die Royal Air Force war viel stärker, als wir angenommen haben und als wir geflogen haben. The Battle of Britain had been won. And although air combat would continue throughout the autumn of 1940, the few who fought in the skies above England had held the Luftwaffe at bay. They had stopped the seemingly unstoppable march of the German military machine and ensured that Britain would not crash to defeat as others before them. They had proved that Britain was willing and able to fight on. By their example, the few gave the people of both the free world and the conquered nations hope and belief in a final victory. Both would be desperately needed in the dark days ahead, for there were many brutal, costly battles yet to be fought. I was very, very proud to have been taking part in what was going on in 1940 over this country. It had a tremendous effect on me because when I went into battle, because of my background, I was immature, scared, afraid to say boot or goose. I was just nobody and it was obvious to me. I was made to feel that in a way. But after the battle of Britain, I could make decisions on anything I could do anything and was afraid of nothing. My main feeling, of course, we didn't know it was Battle of Britain, we didn't know of its historical significance, but I, at the time, or, or now, feel that almost a hypocrite. In other words, these, all these wonderful people died some of them were wonderful aces and were killed. And, uh, I had some wonderful friends who were killed. And I feel that now I'm getting, so to say, some publicity or credibility which really belongs to them. I feel enormously privileged in the sense that I must have feel, I feel, I suppose, as same as the chaps who took part at Trafalgar or Cressy or Agincourt or Battle of Waterloo. We happen to be the right age, the right place, the right time. But really, all I am is representing those who died. The RAF lost 715 fighter aircraft. 544 pilots were killed, nearly one in five of those who flew on operations. Amongst those who died defending the skies over Britain were pilots from Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Poland, Czechoslovakia, France, America, and Belgium. A quarter of the legendary few were from overseas, a debt that is often forgotten. In November 1940, the commander-in-chief of Fighter Command, Sir Hugh Dowding, sent a signal to his fighter pilots. I wish I could say all that is in my heart. I cannot surpass the simple eloquence of the Prime Minister's words. Never before has so much been owed by so many to so few. The debt remains 
and will increase. God bless you all.